For some, football is simply a game, but for others, it can be a chance, an opportunity, and for a few, football is a way of life. For MSU assistant head coach and co-defensive coordinator Harlan Barnett, that's just what the game has become, and he wouldn't have it any other way. I started playing football in uh, third grade. What drew me to it, I just liked the contact, like running and tackling people. I ended up gravitating towards defense as, as time went on, but uh, I just, I just love the competition of it and, and running around hitting people. It was that hard hitting play and physicality that earned him the moniker, the bang stick, and paved his path to Michigan State. Well, that, that came from my father, uh, um, <laughs> the bang stick. I got a jail blind being pursued again, Travis Davis right out. Oh, no hit. Oh, and Harlan Barnett hit Christian. Just oh, all right. what? The bang stick did it again. It only says one thing, you know, I mean, he's going to bring thunder and he's going to hit you. And, and he did from day one. When HB brought it, uh, everyone in the stadium heard it. The great personality and a fun man to be around. You hit, man. You hit people. And that's how we played at my high school. If you didn't hit people, then you were soft and you, you weren't going to play. You weren't going to last very long. So. Um, that, that was my game. You, know, you go out and, and light people up and, uh, and let the chips fall where they may after that. As Barnett made an impact on the gridiron, the Spartan Dogs were bringing new life to Michigan State football and bringing it back to its glory days. After winning the first outright Big Ten title since 1966, the Spartans punched their ticket to play in the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. Uh, the Rose Bowl experience was awesome uh, as a player. Um, <laughs> First of all, that season was a great year. Uh, that was the first year I actually started playing, really starting uh, here at Michigan State. So I was in my third year here at the time and got an opportunity to start and, uh, and play. But uh, we go through that season, play some great teams, USC at the beginning and USC at the end for that, for that year. We opened on first night game in Spartan Stadium on Labor Day night, uh, beat USC here at home, and then uh, go out there and end up playing them in the last game of the season which is always tough to be a team twice in one season. And uh, I'm sure they had revenge on their mind. We go out there in their territory and still get a great win. Um, but the experience was great. Um, my teammates were great. And uh, we, it, was, it was an awesome experience, something that we'll never forget. Which now looms as the biggest play. Way up in the air for grabs. Michigan State has it. And they now can genuinely celebrate the Big Ten has come to Pasadena and will go home a winner. I think every player who comes in wants to feel like they left their stamp or their mark on, on the program. And I think in that era, we, we definitely did uh, win in the Rose Bowl. Very successful under George Burles, and, and Harlan was a, was a huge part of that. Harlan Barnett was the moral compass of our team. That, that's the kind of guy that he was. Uh, you never had to worry about him. And as players, we actually always looked up to Harlan in the locker room and off the field because you knew he was going to make the right decisions that were sound, not only for him and his family, but for his teammates and the organization. After bringing MSU football back into the limelight, Harlan's time in the green and white was coming to a close, but he was nowhere near ready to hang up his pads. You know what, to be honest, uh, I, I didn't even have really any real NFL aspirations until I got here to Michigan State and maybe by that Rose Bowl year, my third year here, and I started believing maybe I'll have a chance. Harlan Barnett on the interception. When I did get drafted and uh, it was the fourth round, the 101st pick, you would have thought I was the first pick in the draft at my house. I believe my house came up off the ground about three or four feet. Uh, when I got drafted, when I got that call from the Cleveland Browns. And so I was that excited uh, to get drafted and, uh, and then be able to, to play seven years. It was a blessing. It was a blessing. That's the best way I can. As I look back on it, the older I get, it definitely was a blessing for me to be able to play that long, especially knowing that the average of an NFL football player is three and a half years. So I really enjoyed my time there. I took away that, hey, <laughs> your job is always in jeopardy. So. Um, always learn to work hard each and every day. If anything else, that's what I brought out of that. Work hard each and every day. With his playing days winding down, one question remained. What was next for Harlan Barnett? 
Well, I actually fought it for a long time, to be honest with you. When I was playing towards the end of my career, I, I've had two different coaches come up to me, um, Tony Dungy one time and, and Bill Parcells another time. I said, you ever think about coaching? I said, no way, no way. Yeah, you spend too much time, man. College or pro coaching? No way. That's just too much time. And, uh, and I wanna, you know, I want my kids to know who I am, you know, and that was my mindset, to be honest with you. Uh, God had another plan for me, so uh, I just got pushed into the uh, college coaching thing. Ended up making a call to uh, Coach Saban down when he was down at LSU in 2000, the fall of 2002. Told him I wanted to get into college coaching, and he said you had the GA. And I'm like, what GA, man? I got a wife and two kids. I'm in my mid 30s. What are you talking about? He said, but you do one year, you'll get a job. And uh, I go down to LSU in June of 2003. We win uh, his first national championship at, uh, in 2003. In January of 04, I get hired by Coach D'Antonio. So I do six months of GA and, and I go down, I hook up with Coach D and I've been with him ever since, since January of 2004 uh, to the University of Cincinnati. After a successful stop at Cincinnati, Barnett had the opportunity to return to his alma mater when Coach D'Antonio earned the head coaching position in 2007. And since Barnett's return to East Lansing, he has once again made his impact felt on the field. But now he's doing it from the sidelines. My two college jobs have been in my hometown, Cincinnati, and my alma mater, Michigan State. So uh, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, put it that way. I know it's a, it's a blessing, it's a God thing for me. And so uh, to come back up here and be able to touch, touch young men's lives uh, the way I'm able to, it's been, it's been great, it's been great. And I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing my purpose right now. And uh, it's, it's an awesome feeling to be able to come out here and work with these guys uh, on a yearly basis and help them to get better, not only as football players, but as young men. As, a, as an ex-player, as an ex-friend, as part of the, the legacy of this, of, of this organization of Michigan State uh, Athletics, having Harlan here is fantastic. There's no doubt about it. But now, when you start to speak to me as a, as a father, and I have to now get ready to send my son off, off to, to basically to manhood, um, you're always looking for somebody out there who you know that you can trust with, with your son or with your daughter, whatever the case may be. And when things worked out for Grayson, I knew that he was gonna be able to come here and be uh, a part of this organization with Harlan. Um, as a father, it just gave me a huge sigh of relief that um, as, as he takes the next step into adulthood, um, he's got a guy or a mentor like Harlan Barnett. And uh, for me as a parent, uh, that's probably the most gratifying and, and, and enriching thing for him coming to Michigan State. Harlan has been successful at every level of the game, but none of his experience on the gridiron can compare to what he's done as a member of the coaching staff at MSU. Since arriving in East Lansing in 2007, he has mentored one of the nation's top secondaries each year, taught two first-round draft picks, and a Jim Thorpe award winner. And while his career is far from over, he can't help but appreciate what he's done so far. Uh, I, I feel blessed, man. I feel blessed. Um, when, when you hear all those things, and I got a ways to go too, so don't don't wrap me up yet. But I, um, it, it is it is a blessing to be able to uh, accomplish all those things and uh, look forward to, to many more things. I'm not done yet, I'm not done yet. Um, and again, credit to my teammates, credit to uh, my, my, my family, um, my, my parents and uh, wife and kids. So just thinking about all of that stuff makes you really, really grateful and humble that you've been able to uh, accomplish those things and knowing that you still have many more to, many more to accomplish. So um, just humble. Humbled and grateful, blessed. Since 1950, the winner of the Michigan State Indiana game has been presented the Old Brass Platoon. Although it's not the most prestigious or well known rivalry trophy in college football, it holds a special place all its own in the history books. Well, in 2011, I got to talk to the actual person that procured the, the brass platoon for Biggie Munn. And uh, in 1950, the Spartans had uh, come off a huge victory against Notre Dame to uh, improve in the polls. And uh, Biggie was worried about a letdown. And uh, 
you know, being the innovator that he was, uh, decided that they needed their own version of the Little Brown Jug to spruce up the rivalry with Indiana and uh, put the junior class president, a, a man named Gene McDermott, in charge of coming up with something to, to lift the spirit of the, the team and the, the fans and the student body. And uh, they found this battered, kicked around spittoon in an antique shop in East Lansing. And uh, a, a little committee went to, to look at it and uh, said that might be the what we need to, to serve as our version of the little brown jug for the Indiana game. What I like about it is that there's a great deal of history involved. Uh, the Old Brass Platoon has been around since both these institutions were founded. Indiana goes back to 1820, the Spartans go back to 1855, and they think uh, this platoon's been around uh, even longer than that. You know, it's kind of a neat old tradition. I think one of the great things about it is it, it, it's, it's kind of a, a piece of living history because you look at it and you wonder, you know, who were the tr fur traders and the, the hunters that came up from Indiana and, and from around Michigan and spit in it or threw a cigar in it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, connecting it to Biggie Munn. And, you know, it says something about those times that, that he would have gone to the class president of the junior cl class and say, you know, we need something to, to rally the boys. And so uh, those are the kind of cool things I think about a traditional history or a traditional uh, trophy like this that uh, isn't necessarily the most celebrated in the nation or you know even in Spartan lore, but uh, I think it's kind of interesting. And, and you know, w w when you win the win the game and you hoist it, I, it, it comes alive again and it's got significance. And it's uh, you know, are they winning it because they want to win the spittoon? No, they want to win it because they need to win a game. In the, in the Big Ten race, but uh, the Spadoon kind of puts an exclamation point on it. Since the Spartans and the Hoosiers put the old brass platoon on the line for the first time, the Spartans lead the series with a record of 45, 12, and 1. While the series has plenty of memorable moments, none stand out more than 1987, as MSU and IU battle not only for the Spadoon, but for the Big Ten championship and a spot in the Rose Bowl. Well, you know, the the game that just jumps out in front of all the rest, if you're a Spartan, has to be 1987. Spartan Stadium, uh, Michigan State beats Indiana to clinch a trip to the Rose Bowl, and they were dropping roses out of the press box. And it was a, it was a great scene, uh, a wonderful day, and uh, you know, a memorable day in the history of Michigan State football. Uh, George Perlis had I've uh, been able to bring the Spartans back to the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all. And as you know, they won the game uh, when they went to Pasadena in a thriller over USC. But uh, the game against Indiana clinched that trip for so many great Spartan fans. You know, everything was riding on that game. The, the spittoon rose in significance. Uh, it was an, as electric of an atmosphere as I've ever seen in Spartan Stadium. The celebration, I don't know what, what happened to the Spittoon after the game because the field was stormed by the Spartan fans uh, winning, you know, going to the, beating the Hoosiers and going to the Rose Bowl. So uh, that certainly was the, the biggest moment, I think, in Spittoon history, that uh, being able to hoist that for that game and win the Big Ten Championship and, and the right to go to the Rose Bowl uh, kind of was the, the high water mark for the, the Spittoon. As Michigan State heads to Bloomington for their 63rd matchup with the Hoosiers, the Spartans hope to continue to add to the history of the old brass platoon. Anytime you play a rivalry game, uh, it's great for the players, and it's good for the fans too, but for the guys on the field, a chance to play for something, something tangible in a trophy game, uh, you can fire up for that. And I think uh, going down to uh, Indiana's place, uh, they got the platoon on the Spartan sideline. You know those other guys want to get it and take it to the other side of the field when the game's over, and you don't ever want to let that happen. And uh, I think that's what makes these games special.
Good evening, everybody, from Bloomington, Indiana. A beautiful night for football. Memorial Stadium here will end up with 45,000 and change. It's a late arriving crowd, but Jason Strayhorn, it's a most important game for both of these teams. Uh, they still have dreams, that's for sure, despite losses last week. Indiana's a team that's starting to put players into the NFL, and uh, they do have some firepower. They'd like to move up a notch in this conference. They both want this one very, very badly. This is a, a Spartan team that's uh, mourning the loss of uh, a player that they've thought so much of over the years. They'll wear number six, and uh, for Milan Hicks, uh, on the back of those uh, helmets and wear those black shoes and black socks that he always liked. Indiana won the toss. They have deferred. Michigan State will receive. Indiana will defend the south goal to our right, so the Spartans will get it first. So it's second and about nine. Under center is Tyler O'Connor. Play fakes to Scott. Stands deep in the pocket, unloads the deep ball. R.J. Shelton has Runs it at the, the 30 of Indiana. Angles to his right. He's inside the 20, inside the 10. Dives for the right pylon. Touchdown, MSU. Tyler O'Connor going for broke to R.J. Shelton. Michigan State 7, Indiana nothing. Second down, one. They go play fakes. Winds up, throws for the left pylon. Incomplete and picked off in the end zone. It's picked off by Viante Copeland over the head of his intended receiver. The ball overthrown to Ricky Jones and picked off by Viante Copeland. And Indiana stops the Spartans and forces a punt here with 3 and 55 to play in the half. Griffin Oaks, the junior from Greenwood, Indiana, will try a 50 yarder as a 49 yarder earlier this year. Not much wind. Here's the kick. And it is no good. Missed it wide to the right. Our halftime score in Bloomington reads the Spartans 7 and Indiana nothing. Spartans kick to start the second half. Well, Indiana obviously still in it. They go play fakes. Winds up, throws for the right pylon. It is going to be knocked away, incomplete, and almost picked by Darian Hicks. Lego hands to Divine Redding, grabbed at the line of scrimmage and thrown down by Malik McDowell. 40-yard field goal try coming up for Griffin Oaks, who missed earlier from 50 just wide to the right. The kick is down and up and wide. He missed this one to the left. First down, snap in the shotgun to Tyler, hands to LJ Scott up the middle, breaks a tackle. Now another LJ's at the 25. L.J. Scott's inside the 25, has a first down. Josiah Price tight right. Tyler O'Connor rolls to his right, throw to a wide open. Delton Williams into the end zone. Touchdown, MSU. Divine Redding back in it, running back for the Hoosiers. End around handoff to Mitchell Page. He wants to throw it back for Lego. He's got it over the shoulder. Near the left pylon, touchdown, Indiana. Now it's fourth and 13 at the 37. The Spartans will punt. He is a low. First and 10 for Indiana at the Spartan 22. Play fake to Nate T by Lego. Throws left side, wide open is Ricky Jones. Inside the left pylon and into the end zone for an Indiana touchdown. We are all even at Bloomington, Indiana. Michigan State 14, Indiana 14. We got a football game on our hands, Jason. We sure do. It's all tied up here in fourth quarter. We talked about this in the opener. If you get, give these Hoosiers some life, this stadium will come alive. Don't allow them to get that arm out to make that throw. Another play fake by Lego. Throws toward the left pylon. Over the outstretched fingertips of Dowell and caught in the end zone by Mitchell Page. The point after is good, it's 21 to 14, Indiana. Four and 38 to go in the game. Check off at the line of scrimmage from Tyler O'Connor. He'll run to his right, toss it back to R.J. Shelton, running left, gets a block. He's at the 45, he's at the 40, and out of bounds goes R.J. Shelton. Second and one at the Indiana 15. Hand off to Gerald Holmes. 
Off the left side, steps out of a tackle, now another, and dives. It's first and goal at the six yard line of Indiana. Prescott line offsets the eye to the right in front of LJ. Snap to Tyler, play fake. Throws it left side, caught. Josiah Price, touchdown MSU. And time is up here in regulation in Bloomington. And Griffin Oaks will try now to win the game from 20 yards. And he hits this one. And Indiana will upset the Spartans in overtime here in Bloomington. Congratulate Indiana. Coach Wilson on what they were able to accomplish tonight. Um, too many mistakes by us, too many penalties. Too many plays we didn't make, we had an opportunity to make. They would have been great plays, some of them, but uh, not very good in overtime. So very disappointed. You know, what we have to do now is claw our way back into things just in terms of, of playing winning football. And uh, I thought our guys played hard, but you know, when our games with Indiana have always, always been very close. They've always been very competitive. And um, all of a sudden, the fourth quarter this time, you know, we didn't win the fourth quarter.